everyone. Hopefully you can hear me and see me all right. You can hear me, great, cool, grand. Sounds like you can hear me. At least someone I've had, had a message to say to that effect. So um, yeah, welcome to the session. Um, my name is Ben, for those of you that have not met me before, hello. Uh, those of you that have been to these sessions um, before, welcome back. Um, uh, I hope you didn't miss me too much last week. <laughs> I um, I did take a, a, a week off, which was um, needed. So, um, but we are doing these every week now um, until, well, until, um, until people say they don't want us anymore, I guess. Um, so for those that are new to these sessions, uh, I'm from Rare, we're a, a research and product innovation company. We've been tracking how consumers have been responding to the COVID-19 pandemic every week for the past 12 weeks, 11 weeks or so. Um, and we run these webinars uh, on a weekly basis to just update people on some of the latest trends and things that we're finding um, and we have specific kind of deep dives into different topics as well each week so we do we do vary it um, slightly uh, in terms of what um, I'll cover today I'll just for those that are new to these sessions I'll give just a really quick overview in terms of the project we're doing and you know why we're doing it and a bit of bit of context there I'll take you through some of the key themes we've seen in um, in the kind of how consumers are responding to the, to the current situation and how that's evolved over the last 12 weeks and what types of themes we might see into the coming months, which is obviously the question that a lot of people are asking. Um, I'll then do a, an overview of some of the brand reputation scores, so how are different companies performing, and then jump into the different categories in more detail from grocery, alcohol, beauty, um, uh, DIY, exercise, grocery. So quite a quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of information. I ran this yesterday for a, a membership company in the advertising sector, and it, it came out about fifty five minutes. So I'll do my best to try and try and get it within that that time frame and leave time for questions as we go. If you have any questions um, throughout the presentation, I will run a, a q and a at the end but please just note them down in the box i'll keep an eye on it um, and if anything comes up as we go through I'll, I'll do my best to to address that grand so in terms of what we're doing um we've, we've got three things that we're running concurrently we have a uh, tracker survey where we interview 900 to 1000 people every week um over the past 11 uh, 12 weeks we've interviewed nearly 11,000 people so you know quite a lot of people a lot of data that we've captured over that time and at the same time we have a brand reputation tracker where we're understanding how good a company's response is or how bad that company's response is and um, we see what their levels of trust and likability are as well so we start to understand what is the reputational impact of companies um who are responding or not responding or potentially responding well, not responding well to the pandemic, and what impact might that have on their ability to uh, retain customers into the future. And then we also have our diary studies where we uh, do deep dive analyses into uh, the household. We ask people what type of new uh, habits are forming in their households, what sort of things do they think that have, you know, new habits they think that have formed that are likely to carry through into the future. And that's really where we, we get the kind of rich context of things. For this week in particular, we, we, had, a, um, we had a partnership with the uh, Institute of Professional Advertisers uh, this week, where we, um, we, uh, we wanted to understand in partnership with those guys, well, what does it feel like for families and how are they responding to the idea that schools are reopening? Um, it's a political hot potato, I suppose, um, for understandable reasons. So we wanted to understand how are they responding to the idea of the, the schools are reopening. So um, the IPA have, have put the data out on their, their website uh, yesterday. But in, for today's session, I'm also going to take you through some of the highlights that we found in that data um, for you guys to uh, yes, hopefully see some interesting insights. I think families are one where um, you know there's there's often a lot of spoken about key workers, often a lot spoken about uh, people in vulnerable positions. But I found with our business, anyone who's got um, you know children, really struggling to balance the the uh, the pressures of work and home life. So I really wanted to uh, wanted to investigate it further. 
for context this week, just following up on that, um, in the first couple of days, had teachers around the UK reporting that there's been real variable attendance rates to schools between uh, 40%, 70% in primary schools. It just goes to show that, you know, there's there's not, certainly not a consensus on the reopening of schools. Um, you know, there's, there's obvious concerns about safety, but it's also, <clears throat> for a lot of people, it's the kind of de facto way of getting childcare. So for those that are juggling two jobs in a household, um, it's, it's in some ways offers a bit of light relief, if I can say that, um, to, to those, those sort of pressures. At the same time, in, in terms of, I think, what's you know, really, really kind of staggering is just the number of jobs that have been furloughed in the UK. It's currently standing at 8.4 million jobs, which is, yeah, I mean, if you were to kind of guess that before the pandemic, I, I'm, I'd be surprised if anyone thought it would be that high. But of course, the concern longer term is what happens when that support goes, um, uh, particularly for uh, more lower skilled uh, roles, uh, where there's, you know, potentially where demand as well isn't necessarily as high for certain services or the capacity can't cope with it. There's clearly going to be some job losses as a result, which has been announced by, you know, the, the government are, certainly aren't hiding that fact uh, when they when they discuss it. Um, also, what's a really important context for the data this week that we're seeing is um, uh, Barney Castle Gate. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, you know, I won't get too political about things, but um, there's certainly, a, you know, the accusations that the government have lost control of the message, I, you know, has been been a, across all the all the press over the last couple of weeks. It's quite curious to look at the data. Um, you know, I'm not sure if looking through our data at least um, and some other studies I've seen, it's certainly not the case that everybody thinks, well, you know, screw it, I'll just do what I want. Um, the data we're seeing is a little bit more reserved than that, which I'll talk about in more details, because that has a huge impact, of course. And the concerns, you know, longer term are going to be, well, how do you then try to control a population if you, you, you know, you don't keep a consistent message? So there's some certainly some lessons for everybody um, in that. Um, and we're moving into a phase where some lockdown measures have been uh, relaxed, despite the uh, the uh, I was in PMQs yesterday. The, saying that we're still in uh, phase four or status four or whatever the, the, the language is. So there's still question marks over the, the validity or the, 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 the evidence to support whether that's safe. Um, last night, you might have seen for any of you news nerds that um, UK has currently got the, uh, uh, the higher death rate than the rest of, the, of Europe put together. So we really are quite going into some unknown territories. And when we get requests from companies, lots of people are asking about, well, you know, what what might we expect? And the truth is, you know, things are very uncertain uh, in general, but particularly in the UK with, with some of these pressures that we're seeing I've identified on, on this particular chart, you know, are, are making things harder, I think, for companies to plan for what happens next. So, um, so in terms of the research, um, I've, we've been really curious over the last four weeks to understand what, if you ask people what they're looking forward to, what does that pattern look like? For those that have been to these webinars before, it's a similar sort of pattern that we are seeing still, which is that people predominantly are looking forward to spending time with their families, seeing their friends. Actually, the proportion of people who say they are looking forward to seeing their friends has grown over the past few weeks, but the mentions of families have uh, increased from 32% to 47% a couple of weeks ago, and are now, now back down to, to 40%. But the majority of people, if you ask them what they're looking forward to, it's not necessarily around uh, their ability to, to invest and spend money, go shopping, etc. They're much more concerned with spending time with their friends uh, and to travel as well, which travel is one category that we're certainly seeing a, a high degree of desire for people to, to engage in that category. It's grown from 4% to 8% over the past four weeks and has remained 8% for the last, last two weeks. Um, so it really does go to show that that's something people desire and I think one one thing I find quite touching about this is that as a you know as a as a, as a species as a um, as a society you know we really do focus on our relationships and our ability to see and uh, experience things um, which has very much been a kind of a desire of the, the marketing industry of the past three years to you know to, to sort of offer that as a uh, you know as a uh, a proposition to people and just goes to show that you know there's that's very much part of the human experience <clears throat> if 
if you ask families, so people with children, what they're looking forward to, it's even it's even greater a, a contrast. They actually, the majority of people, 52%, are saying, I want to spend time with the families, let the children see their grandparents, be able to interact with my wider uh, family circle, uh, and the ability to, to socialise. And a, a, a fairly sizable proportion, 9% of uh, families saying they're looking forward to go back to work. Um, so, you know, I think certainly in the data we've seen where we've asked people who are homeschooling, um, they, they really are, some, in some cases, struggling with the balance, balance of that. So it's no real surprise um, that we're seeing. Um, I just had, uh, no, hopefully, just want to check, can everyone hear me all right? I understand uh, a couple of people have got issues with audio. If you can hear me, just um, type yes in the call. Cool. So yeah, um, it might be on your device. I've got lots of people saying, yeah, they can hear me. So um, yeah, it might be a, a technical glitch on your machine, I'm afraid. Thanks for, uh, thanks everyone for chiming in. <laughs> Great to see everyone's responsive. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, I like to kind of open things up to a poll. So if we look at, um, kind of look at the, the current state of things. Currently we're looking forward, still looking forward to spend, spending time with our families. That's very much, at the, the heart of what people are looking forward to. Now, how are we going to get around is, is quite a challenging, um, a challenging question. So I'm going to open it up to a poll um, and ask you, you people, um, think about your own habits, think about you know, what you'd feel comfortable with and which of the following would you um, prefer to use if, when returning back to work? So you can select one or more of the following. Um, shouldn't really be a single choice, but you know, give you a couple of options to see. I think it's quite interesting to see how people on these webinars vote and actually what the general public think. So um, I'll just wait till we get a couple more votes in. If you're not able to um, use the poll, if you minimise your screen, uh, the buttons will uh, start to work. If you've got any issues there, cool. So I'll close close the poll share the results should be able to see that yeah this is um this is really consistent so um as i mentioned i, I ran uh, the session with a membership organization yesterday um and similar results came out i think what you notice here is that people are more inclined to use modes of transport where they feel more control over the, their environment so it's a safer safe space makes sense uh, no real surprises there now, if you think about the desire for people, you know, want to be able to see their family, they want to move around um, and uh, see, see and experience things, particularly in travel, um, then it's kind of interesting to see how the general public feel about traveling at the moment. So if you ask them what type of mode of transport they feel most comfortable with, um, they mostly feel comfortable with walking, taking the car, using a bicycle or motorbike. So a mode of transport where they feel they're in, in more control as opposed to uh, you know taking the tube um, or, or going by aeroplane and that that does quite interestingly tie up with the proportion of people we found in the last most recent weeks who were interested in traveling internationally and traveling in the UK I've got an update on that um, for those of you who had interest in it um, last couple of weeks so there's still some nervousness about how we're going to travel around which will have an impact on you know the reopening of you know retail spaces high streets um it's still it would seem a bit of a, a slow um uh, sort of slow interest in order to uh to, to engage in that category both in terms of the desire and the ability to travel there in terms of people's sense of community i've been really interested in this i think more kind of socially over the last few weeks because um i thought what was quite curious looking at this data this is a measurement of how many people feel a sense of community with their family, their friends, their local area, or um, the others around the globe. What we're seeing, I think the kind of interesting thing, just re reflecting on where we've been as a, as a, as a country and our, our struggle with identity, is this line around sense of community with others, others around the world. It peaked, we commenced on the 13th of April, and currently is at its lowest level of 41%. And, you know, a lot of that is going to be due to how um, people in the UK, um, you know, how people in the UK uh, compare our performance with with other countries as well. So um, 
yeah so i think there's there's some there's some particularly more international brands this is going to be really important for uh, organizations that have uh, more of a kind of localized approach to your comms this would suggest that actually a kind of local message is probably more likely to resonate than a than an internationalist message potentially so this is really important um, with comms and it's also really important in terms of how people feel and the tone of things so the pervading emotion for the past you know 11 weeks has been one of worry now that's currently sitting at 36 percent we've seen quite a significant drop of five percent in the last week um certainly uh, you know i think the, the controversies that we've seen around um the behaviors of, of advisors to the government has had an impact that's quite clear from the data that we're seeing as has the messaging around changes to the lockdown rules so that's also uh, whilst that has reduced by five percent we've seen an increase in the number of people who feel content by four percent to, to now at a level where 19 percent of people in the uk claim they feel content with the current situation again that that is potentially um uh, a little bit of a, a challenge i suppose for organizations that you know hoping people will start to visit physical spaces and so on um and at the same time not only have we got one in five people say they feel content we've got a similar number of people who claim they feel restless so the kind of competing emotion so that's going to be super important uh with comms super important with product development how you empathize with users um, and understand their their types of issues it's all going to be, um, uh, yeah, very important. I think to, to to keep tabs on, particularly if you're able to test out communications almost in real time, see how they're landing. Well, this is a useful starting point, I think, for you to to bear in mind. So I mentioned that um, uh, families is something we we're quite interested in this week. There's you know there's 19 million of them in the UK, plenty. Um, so it's a it's a significant cohort of people. Um, we wanted to know how they feel and currently families are more likely to feel worried um, and they're less likely to feel content than the general population so again if you're in a position where you're communicating with kind of families or you offer services in in that type of that type of environment um there there is although schools have reopened there's there's a high degree of uh, concern around that opening and people are looking for that support 65 percent of, of parents tell us they are not supporting um, the reopening of schools. Uh, the majority of them actually feel worried about it. Um, and 53% agree that balancing home life uh, and work uh, is, is quite a challenge. Um, and when you look at how, how they feel with regard to the kind of support they're getting from their employer, about 25% of people agree that they believe their employer could do more to support them. So those in leadership roles, I think this is this is an, they're an important cohort to check in. Not just I've I've heard lots of stories from you know clients and people that I, I speak to in the industry about how they've managed communications with people who have been furloughed. Obviously, um, that's a really important thing to do. But also, I think it's important to just check in with uh, people who've got dependents and how they're they're managing things. Um, so there's certainly uh, a high degree of which people feel that you know looking over here the, the the situation has led to a high degree of stress at, at home and if you look at the verbatim if you're interested in seeing some of this i think it's really quite uh, it's really quite interesting to read through you see comments where people say you know I, you know, my kids at home don't really want to learn it's really affecting my child's mental health i'm finding it hard to balance these these things out now in terms of <clears throat> solutions to this obviously one solution is schools reopen people go back but the reality of that is that it's it's not going to be um it's certainly not supported across the uk uniformly um for, for different reasons um and it's one where lots of um parents don't necessarily support that either the majority of them actually don't so i think there's a role to play for employers um to to see how we can help support people with that that balancing of things um and certainly that you know that has an impact on you know ultimately consumer experiences this is all really important because ultimately you know like any business you're only ever as good as the people you employ so i think it's just a really important one for people to to, to uh, be mindful of in terms of the level of concern um what we've seen in the most recent weeks if you you scroll your eyes there to the right hand side is that the the levels of extreme concern have somewhat de uh, decreased in the last couple of weeks that's the 
yellow line that you can see. Um, and that's been replaced uh, with a feeling of, uh, in the green line of people, there's been an increase in the number of people saying they feel somewhat concerned. And overall, what we've seen is that 13% of people in the UK say they don't feel at all concerned about the coronavirus, which is perhaps, I think, a little bit at odds to how it's being spoken about in the media. So the media um, has been, you know, the way that a lot of it works is to um, amplify certain messages. <clears throat> there is some nuance in that, which is that it isn't necessarily the case that, you know, all bets are off and people are just doing whatever they want. This suggests actually you've still got 87% of people who feel a degree of concern about a situation. So there is, we still have a responsibility, not just in terms of you know our moral obligations to to protect people, but also in terms of how we empathise uh, and, and communicate with people at, at this particular time. Um, certainly, I think the events that have happened in the, the US and some of um, you know the uh, protests we've seen um, last couple of days as well will you know add complexity to this this picture um, and. Um, you know, that's a whole other topic, I think, for perhaps for another session in terms of how, how companies are responding to that and what, what the, the impacts are going to be. Um, if you ask families how they feel with their level of concern, it's no surprise as we've seen, they're more likely to feel worried um, uh, as an emotion, but we're seeing that they, compared to the UK, they are less likely to feel that they uh, do not feel at all concerned. So they, you know, overall the level of concern within uh, families is higher um, and they're more likely to feature at the, the kind of extremity with that, that, uh, that level of concern as well. So when we're thinking about comms, we're thinking about segmenting groups, how we communicate to people, then there's, there, there is a huge difference in age groups, people in, at, at different life stages. It's, it's really a, quite a different story um, I don't quite cover all that in detail in these sessions because there's just so much data, but if you, you do want to see some of that data, um, then of course, please get in touch. Um, so in terms of, terms of the, the trends, I think obviously we, for the most, the most recent couple of weeks, looking at some of the more macro pictures, the, the changes in um, lockdown measures from the government hasn't necessarily meant that everybody's comfortable um, going back to, to normal and being outside. We're seeing quite a balance, still seeing that 36% of people feel worried, but you've got that worry is being replaced by two competing emotions of restlessness and content. And there are, there are things to just bear in mind that we're seeing quite a diversity in terms of, of, of a response to this. It's certainly not in any way a uniform uh, pattern that, that we're seeing. Um, families are more likely to feel worried. They're more likely to be concerned about things um, in the UK the majority of us feel some some degree of concern to the situation. So it's, it shows no sign of uh, diminishing despite the changes to, to lockdown measures. I think in some cases it probably increases that level uh, of, of anxiety. So what about the reputational impact? I'm going to dare to try another poll. I realised as I was talking, I didn't share the results of the last one with you, which was pretty poor form for me. I apologise. Um, I was curious to know what you guys thought of. Here are the top 10, uh, top 10 brands that we've measured when we ask people uh, which brands give, have, they, they believe have given a good or bad response to the pandemic. So this is the top 10. Hopefully you should have to see this. I will remember to share the results with you. If you're struggling, I've just seen a note from someone earlier. If you are um, unable to answer the poll, if you minimise your screen, or you minimise the window of the, uh, the presentation, the button should work. Um, so just let me know if that, that doesn't work. Hopefully it does. Um, cool, so majority of you have voted. I will close, I will share. Hopefully you can see that. You should see this, right? Good. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting pattern because again, similar, actually quite remarkably similar to running this uh, yesterday. So 37% of people reckon, or 37% of you guys reckon, Amazon comes out top and Tesco and MNS and then Google and McDonald's around the same level. So if I hide those results, just remember that, 37% for Amazon. Um, the, it's actually uh, Tesco at 56% of people claim or believe Tesco have given um, a good 
uh, response to the pandemic, Amazon's uh, at 50%. So uh, yeah, it's not necessarily the case that I think we often sort of think that the uh, the tech companies just because they've Amazon have done quite a good job with uh, you know being able to uh, do their um, fulfill uh, people's needs. Um, you know, there's been quite a lot of uh, in the press about their, their improved performance uh, with, with fulfillment, but actually Tesco comes up top. Um, uh, hopefully you can still hear me all right. I've just had a couple of notes saying my video is paused, but hopefully you're still able to hear me. Do shout if you do shout if you can't. Um, so, yeah, so we've seen overall, um, we're seeing Tesco comes out as, as the strongest performer overall. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to look at uh, New Look this week, um, see how they're performing um, over the last eight weeks or so. What we've seen for New Look has been progressively a, a downward trajectory in terms of the level to which people think they've given a good response to the pandemic, as you can see here, sort of de decreased. And that's coincided with um, a fall in their level of trust and their level of likability. When you look at the timeline in terms of what they've been doing, on the 4th of April, they announced they were going to delay payments to suppliers. Um, and they were one of many retailers who pulled out of a uh, £5.2 billion pounds worth of stock uh, in Bangladesh to the, uh, the the manufacturers over there. So they, there was, um, they, they struggled a little bit um, in terms of their perception. But more recently, have announced that they will be slashing the prices of some of their stock by up to 70% in the hope that you know that will encourage people to to come out and, and spend. So I think it's going to be interesting when um, when retailers open again, how this how this plays out, how the experience of going into a store and how a store ensures that safety, what impact that has on um, people's desire to come back, their perception of the brand. You know, this this type of data we're, we're capturing certainly is uh, is going to have value way into the future. Um, whilst we're, we're still grappling with this 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 uh, the impact of the pandemic longer term, um, so well, let's see. I think it'd be interesting in the last last week. Or so we've seen a slight uptick in that level of trust, but it's an almost perfect correlation with how they've responded to the pandemic and the trust they have as a business. And as I've mentioned several times in the webinar, and this is why it's so important is trust is such a fundamental part of loyalty to a to a business regardless of the sector that you're in so that's why it's super important to uh, to measure that uh, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the last three weeks for some of the food on the go brands um, when you compare you know Pret, Greg's, um, McDonald's, Subway, Costa and, and Nero it's curious to see if you cast your eye down the, to the bottom of those um, those charts the the, the brands that have performed better are Costa and Cafe Nero. Costa have reopened their drive-through um, stores uh, and, and they've, they've been really quite proactive in at ensuring um, they've got all the necessary safety measures in place. Um, that might, this might be uh, the reason why they're, 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 they're performing reasonably well at the moment. Cafe Nero have also announced that they are doing home delivery through Deliveroo, which would you know partly explain why they're seeing um, positive score as well. Um, I thought I would take it back to travel since uh, we've got a few people on the call from the travel sector. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see this because there have been, you know, quite relatively low scores in, in, for airlines compared to other sectors um, in the um, in the in the past few uh, past. Well, certainly a couple of weeks ago, those scores at sort of 30% for a good response to COVID pandemic is actually way lower than lots of other categories but I've been really curious to know with, with BA that they seem to have created a little bit of um, blue ocean I shouldn't say blue ocean that's not right is it it's blue skies I suppose um, compared to the other brands their, their reputation has improved in, in the last few weeks so um, yeah it's worth I think sort of looking at what, what they've done in terms of uh, PR and comms over, over the past few weeks and we know that people are thinking about travel more so as people are thinking about travel we've seen in our data that people uh, there's quite a high degree of people actually planning their their trips at the moment and thinking about what where they might go um 
So yeah, I think it's quite an interesting um, performance. Again, we're going to measure this in, in the next few weeks as people are more likely to buy uh, holidays, how that pitch is going to change compared to other categories. I, it'd be really interesting to see how this all moves, you know, as people are able to, to travel again and, and more reliant on these types of services, will we start to see an occasion where brands more associated with experiences actually perform better with brands that are associated with kind of essentials and, and sort of, you know, fairly kind of routine, routine mundane things like shopping. No offence to anyone who works in grocery, of course, because it can be exciting. Um, so I wanted to just now jump into the sectors in a bit more detail. So um, with travel, the, the, the kind of message that's, that's coming out here at the moment is um, people, we are seeing evidence of people moving into that planning phase and starting to imagine what that could look like. But currently, we have 47% of people would um, consider travelling only inside the UK, and that's increased 5% in the last last couple of weeks. So, with restrictions being put in place in other countries, the the uh, quarantine um, restrictions, which were debated at PM at PMQs yesterday. Um, uh, you know, since that's there's been more uh, conversation about that, that's likely to have an impact on people's desire to travel internationally, which a couple of weeks ago was around 23%. Um, <clears throat> so there's certainly more of a case of people willing to travel in the UK. If you look at the data, that generally tends to be more of an older demographic. It tends to be a, a, a group of people who are more concerned about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's curious to kind of see how different uh, cohorts are, are, are responding to things. If you ask people what type of accommodation would they prefer to stay in when they go traveling, similar to your responses with um, how you see yourself traveling to work, which is predominantly, you know, using cars, going by, uh, going by motorbike, or bicycle, or walking, you, you know, it's very much you're selecting ways of getting to work which you have great control over the environment and you can feel more safe. It's a similar sort of pattern here with what we see with accommodation. 39% of people say they'd be, they'd be willing to stay in hotels, 19% saying in um, holiday cottages or your second home up in Durham. Um, I'll stop, I'm sorry. Um, and 7% of people saying uh, Airbnb. Now, I thought that was quite interesting because obviously Airbnb has been very much the kind of darling of the industry or the kind of the threat of the industry, depending on you know, how, you, how you perceive things. But that would indicate, though, that where people feel they, they can't necessarily control the environment or there's more risk, they're inviting more risk into their, their routines, they're less likely to want to stay in them. Hostels there at, at 2%, um, you know, which is, which is uh, no, no real surprise. This is going to be really. Um, this is going to be really important, um, particularly if you think about the um, think about the return to taking holidays. Um, I watched a TV show recently with an analyst from the travel sector that said, even if we saw 15% of the UK have holidays in the UK over the summer, we're going to struggle with capacity. And obviously now we're at reduced capacity, so we're going to have a real problem with supply and demand and um, I know there's, there's uh, some authorities in the UK are looking at how we can control um, or, or stage people's desire to, to take holiday in the UK but the paradox of course is that's one way of, of kick-starting a local economy so it's going to be really quite challenging for, for, for regions to control, control that and where are people willing to stay it's predominantly uh, seasides and rural areas um, uh, so we're likely to see a kind of balancing act, I think, in terms of uh, the distribution of people when they're going on holiday. They're less likely to say city centres, and as we've seen, that's where you're more likely to see public transport, and the desire for public transport is greater diminished. So that all of these things are just related. You know, it's it's not necessarily about the destination, but it's about all the facets and the experiences of that destination which play a role. Um, and when we think about, uh, you know, what people are likely to do in their um when, when they're you know potentially on holiday or, or when the lockdown restrictions are lifted and people can go to restaurants and bars you ask people how they, they currently feel whether they'd be willing what environments they'd be willing to stay in if you take a bit of a broad view at this data and take a bit of a, a snapshot this is really telling you that people will feel more willing to go to restaurants or hotels 
but they're less willing necessarily to go to, to bars. And what, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that, again, it comes down to how you can, how, how much you feel in control of the space that you're in, how much you feel that you're potentially at risk to uh, accidentally interacting with someone who might, might be infected. Uh, in bars and pubs, of course, your behavior tend, the, the social interactions behaviors can be more, uh, can I say, chaotic with how people uh, engage in those spaces compared to restaurants and hotels where there's very much kind of a kind of a, a cleaner, more lean, uh, more linear journey to that, that particular um, experience. Um, I thought it'd also be super interesting to look at, um, yeah, you know, we've got all this data on people's attitudes to um, their safety, how they feel. I, I was quite interested to see, well, how do you play that out in a scenario? So I said to people, um, this was a, a, a little bit of work we did with um, HOSPA, who represent the hospitality sector a couple of weeks ago, and we asked, um, what distance do, would you feel comfortable in if you were to sit next to someone in a restaurant? You know what proportion of people would feel comfortable at two meters you got 44 percent of people saying two meters is where i'd feel comfortable Can you see my hand might be there i don't know i can't really see myself on the screen to be honest i tend, generally tend to hide it but you've got you've got um 28 of people who say actually i'm comfortable within that two meter radius i feel quite comfortable and that's potentially when you look at the data and uh, you look at the open end response it's because they feel quite comfortable knowing that the WHO recommend one meter. Some of them just think, well, screw it, I'm fine. This is this is a, this is a load of hype, I don't believe it. Some people, you know, do kind of reject the social distancing uh, measures, which is, you know, a concern. But you've got another 28% of people who are the opposite, who are saying, no, I want more space. Give me, give me some room, I feel quite anxious. It's, and it's, it's gonna be problematic. It's, it, it shows again, I mentioned earlier, we've got this real divide in the UK around who feels restless, who feels more content, even if worry is the main emotion. While that now plays out into their, their behaviors, if they don't feel they're gonna get that space um, that, they, that they feel is acceptable for them, they might not necessarily um, you know, go, go, into, go into restaurant for, for that experience for both reasons. For, you know, for those that actually want a bit more room, they're just going to feel more anxious and those that actually feel that this is this is too much. I can't enjoy this space. All right. I'll get food on delivery and stay at home. It's a real it's it's going to be tricky, not only just because of the, 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 the moral responsibility to ensure safety, but all the comms and the experience that we create. I think there's lots of evidence of how different companies have managed that, um, which I've talked about in previous webinars with how you can create. Uh, uh, an experience in a, in a space that is restricted. Um, <clears throat> in terms of en entertainment, um, this has been one that we've been fascinated with um, at Rare over the, the past few weeks. The kind of lead message is there's an element of consistency we've seen over the past few weeks, which is, you know, lots of people still listen to music. It's it's the the, the entertainment people um, kind of go to more than more than anything else. We've still got one in five people learning new skills, and I think that is very much um, here to stay out of the pandemic. I think there's a huge opportunity across many sectors for, for companies um, where people have used their time outside of work when they're stuck at home to do something productive and have had enough time to, to become damn good at it as well. Um, so you can expect, I think, a whole wave of, of new and quite interesting initiatives that, that come out of it. People who are on furlough are more likely to be watching TV at the moment compared to those that, that, that currently aren't on furlough. And I thought gaming is an interesting one. It's uh, looking at the data, we're seeing that people who, who are um, employed full time are just as likely to be actually playing um, games of those who aren't. So gaming isn't necessarily uh, the domain of those with, with idle thumbs. Um, it's something that I've, you know, regardless of the situation, lots of people are still engaging with. So um, <clears throat> that's the sector, speaking to people who work in it, that's done particularly well over, over the pandemic. And here it is just sort of played out. You can see fairly consistent pattern with, with the habits that we're seeing. Um, I think what's quite interesting actually is this kind of, you know, there is a reduction in terms of, it's only a slight one, but um, from 46 to 42% of people seeking out content they're already familiar with. But um, if you look over the right hand side, as I, I've drawn the attention to a couple of times, there really is a high degree of people who are looking to, uh, you know, develop new skills. And of course, it is still the case, you know, streaming services are doing well, no surprise, but, you know, 
and trying to say something different, I suppose, than what you might see um, uh, in the media, because um, not everyone can afford the, the same level of budgets as Netflix and Amazon, clearly. Uh, but I know uh, that a lot of productions are, are back up and running, so um, lots of companies trying to trying to get that content out there, and that's going to become the challenge, I think, in the next few next few months is how they keep up with that content and give you access to it. <clears throat> in Growth Three, the main messages. We're seeing a pretty consistent uh, story here. So in terms of weekly online shopping, varies between 34 to a staggering 51% of people will buy their groceries online um, each week. So that what that tells you is that it's not every week people are um, buying groceries online, they might be doing it every other week. And topping up locally, so 35% of people um, who are household decision makers bought their food and essentials from a convenience store, which is really high. Um, and that, of course, will be at the detriment to um, supermarkets where, you know, they've got these kind of lengthy queues where people are getting a little bit frustrated at waiting at, uh, waiting in line. I, I had to do a trip for a member of my family at the weekend in the Midlands um, and I was staggered by 20 past nine outside the, the local uh, Waitrose that the queue was over 20, 20 people deep. Um, thankfully, what, what my, uh, my folks were looking for wasn't necessarily that important, so it's fine. But you know, these, these social distance messages will have an impact on people's experience of, of your space. And, you know, growth, there's lots of innovations out there for, for companies to, to take advantage of it. In fact, I came across this uh, this week, which is a, uh, a partnership between WhatsApp and Lidl in Ireland. If you want to check it out, um, if you go to lidl.ie forward slash quiet, it's effectively a chatbot that you just text a number on WhatsApp and it will tell you how busy your local little store is currently and when is the, the right time for you to go and visit. I think that's genius. It's such a smart little tool. It recognizes that that is, you know, WhatsApp is a, a service that lots of us use to keep in touch with people. So the, the, the barriers to entry, barriers to usage are quite low. People feel confident using a service they've used lots of times before um, and we've seen other innovations with uh, Top Table that I mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago, where they've pivoted their uh, technology not to just reserve a space um, at a restaurant, but you can now book a, a slot at a supermarket. So there's plenty of ways for supermarkets to to improve that experience, as long as uh, those damn guys in IT will let you do it, I suppose. Um, it's usually the problem, isn't it? One sector that's constantly performing well and shows no sign of uh, slowing down is the DIY sector. I think it saw a, a bit of a bank holiday boost last week. So 38% of people in the UK um, were doing uh, DIY three times or more uh, last week. And I think what's quite encouraging is looking at the balance of gender as well. So you've got 28% of men and 19% of women. So um, one in four or one in five of those genders who are getting engaged with it and doing doing something about it. So there's, I think, a lot of opportunity um, into the into the future. Um, and there's clear evidence, of course, that people are bringing in external contractors to to take out uh, tasks around the home or, or outside the home for, for that matter as well. So there's, clearly there's there's uh, engagement in this. And if, as we've been spending more time at home, lots of people have, have turned their focus into being productive in the home environment, not necessarily sitting there and, you know, just watching Amazon and Netflix and not doing anything particularly useful. It just goes to show there is a desire for people to do something productive with their time, which is, you know, I think encouraging to see. You see, also look at the, the, the their future intention. You've got the majority, 52% of people foresee no change in their behaviour with engaging in this category into, into the future. And we're also seeing, in terms of the variation with those that claim they will spend more or less, there's no clear picture <clears throat> um, uh, to, to, to give any indication that this appetite is going to diminish anytime soon. I think one thing that's come out, come out of this uh, pandemic is people very much you know, focus on the communities, focusing on their, 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 their friends and connecting with other people, but also learning new skills and, and, and developing themselves personally, which will have an impact it will have a knock-on effect on our desire for kind of you know rampant consumerism as it as it might have been before. It will it will look different. In the retail space, um, overall the performance is stable, but there's some really interesting patterns. And if you look at apparel, what we've seen is that currently 20 20% of women um, uh, bought uh, apparel 
online last week and, and shopped online for it um, in the last week. But that's increased from uh, from 15 to 17 to 20 in the last three weeks. So it would seem as there's a suggestion that we are going to be able to spend more time with people, there's more reason to, to purchase. Uh, similarly with electronics, that's increased by uh, 12, from 12% to 22% for men um, over the past few weeks. So there, there's certainly some trends in different demographics. And if you look at the overall picture, we're seeing that hobbies and interests still, you know, are still come out top, rank top, currently with uh, where people are, are more likely to be to be spending um, money online currently uh, compared to apparel, which is still um, still you know still a little bit behind. Um, but certainly, it just goes to show, I think, and backs up the case that people are being productive with their time. That they're, they're trying to do things that are useful. Um, and not only are they doing that, they're willing to, to, to spend money and there's no sign that that's, that's slowing up anytime soon. I think what is of a concern for the, for the retail sector is that there's less, you know, the, you've got 48%, so it's certainly not quite the majority of people who say their behaviour is likely to remain unchanged, but we've got more people claiming they intend to spend less in the future than those that intend to spend more. So I think we're going to see... Um, uh, you know, we're going to. If I was, if I was kind of be a, a betting person on this, I think there's there's going to be some some difficulties. I think with uh, when we we open up the high streets, in terms of the the overall UK population, doesn't necessarily seem to suggest that we're we're going to be um, straight off the blocks. And one way <clears throat> to solve the problem is a um, lot of a lot of shopping for people is quite a social endeavour. So some people will go to their you know meet up on a, a Saturday, go into town, get a coffee, go do a bit of shopping, have a glass of wine at your local um, bar. Um, and it's become really an exercise in socialising, not an exercise in, in shopping necessarily. It's just a space where you can meet. Um, social e-commerce is a trend that's been seen in China for the past couple of years. And it's, it's you know, really expected as a, you know, quite a, it's quite a dominant um, means where, how people shop. There's a, a new service that's been launched over here in Europe um, called Squadded, which is just a browser extension where you can just chat with your mates online. You can search through different products and share and discuss things that you like together. And I think that's that's quite a nice, um, potentially a nice way of solving this problem of social distancing and, and people being less willing to, to go out the house uh, together or to meet in, in public spaces. Um, so I just wanted to put that on, on people's radar. What we're seeing in retail is, is similar to what we're seeing in, in beauty as well, where um, the kind of movement to, to purchase is, is you know, the, 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 is, is quite a small kind of movement in the last week, but there is opportunity with different cohorts. So key workers are more likely to be look, seeking advice. Younger people are more likely to be watching YouTube content, um, which you might not necessarily be surprised with. And around one in 10 people um, bought treatments this week, which is pretty steady. Uh, compared to the last few weeks, we've seen it fluctuate sort of between uh, between nine, twelve, thirteen percent, uh, somewhere around that figure. Of course, um, this sector will be opening quite soon. Uh, we work quite a lot in aesthetics, so we work with a company that uh, is a manufacturer of uh, toxins and fillers. One concern I think that is present in that market is for those that have non-cosmetic surgery that lots of people administer it. So uh, nurses and dentists and doctors have uh, volunteered themselves to go back into the NHS and actually close down their aesthetics practice. But the minimum time period for them to go back to the NHS is six months. So it might mean there's not necessarily as much of a supply for, for more advanced uh, treatments in the coming weeks. And you can see uh, in terms of people's engagement with it over the past few weeks remains relatively steady. Um, so in terms of a kind of that sector has not necessarily been so dynamic in the last week. With exercise, um, exercise is, is interesting where uh, I think the kind of main main point I'd make with this is that those that don't feel concerned about coronavirus are more likely to be exercising compared to those that do feel uh, concerned. Overall, what we're seeing is that although you're able to go running, do be more active outdoors, in terms of what people are likely to do with that uh, that um, permission is uh, walking. So 38% of the UK uh, walked at least three times a week or more. 
Uh, women are way more proactive than, than men at doing exercise. Uh, that's, we've seen that throughout the whole of the, the pandemic. Um, still the case now, they're more likely certainly to be to be running. It's 20% of women compared to 13% of, of men. Um, and uh, it's around one, uh, one in eight of, of us run at least once this week, which is you know, quite a high proportion uh, of, of people. Um, still a high proportion of people doing exercise at home. So one in four are uh, working out in the home space um, at least three times or, or more a week. So there's still, <clears throat> still some activity, but overall, I think what's limiting the, the, the kind of exercise uh, market and why we haven't seen that many new people enter into it is just people's confidence with knowing what's right for them <clears throat> and their confidence with the, 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 the pandemic, how comfortable they feel is inhibiting um, the, the kind of growth. And what we might expect in the future is <clears throat> similar pitch to the DIY sector. I think it's going to remain, currently it looks like it's going to remain relatively unchanged to how, how it is at the moment. So um, not necessarily seeing any, uh, any particular growth currently, but of course we're going to be uh, monitoring that as we move through. For alcohol, um, the I think the kind of lead message really for this week is that it's it's a steady mark. It's it's pretty steady over the past few weeks. It hasn't really changed a great deal. There's a high proportion of people in the UK who are drinking alcohol every day. So one in five people, which is you know it's it's it's, it's pretty high. Um, men are more likely to be drinking alone compared to women. Um, and you know, I, I, I do talk about this. I think on on these webinars, but I think in the, when you look at the data, people who are working are more likely to be drinking than those that aren't working. It's clearly the stress of being able to balance things is tough. Uh, when you talk to businesses that have furloughed employees or have got <clears throat> departments of one, I was I was on the phone to um, someone who's uh, used. Is a, a dear colleague of ours who used to work with us on a freelance basis and last year he moved to a different business he was in a team of eight um, he's an absolute superstar um, and now he's a, he's, a, he's a team of one um, on his own having to do all this um, you know kind of make up for um, the, 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 the lack of bandwidth in his team and he looks exhausted and um, I think for lots of people um, alcohol is a way of, uh, is a coping mechanism so I think we need to need to be really careful with that in terms of new product development, obviously um, street tests and, and um, <clears throat> out of home experiences is a really important way for the alcohol sector to get people to trial new products. Now, if we're seeing that people aren't necessarily so willing to, to, to go into physical spaces, but we've still got a high degree of people who would like to try new, new things. We've got 13% of millennials saying uh, they sought new ideas for alcoholic drinks then um, in the last week. Then I think there is an opportunity for um, for companies in this space to to consider you know other ways, other means of being able to get people to to trial new products um, that that might exist. Um, so yeah, it's been um, what what you can expect from us. We're back into now doing these weekly, so I will be as usual sending you round the slides and an invite to next week at eleven. Um, next week we're going to have a similar format, but we're going to start to integrate. Um, uh, other other aspects of our business into these these sessions as well. So we will be covering um, more topics related to innovation and how companies have gone from kind of a nexus of an idea to actually growing it through the pandemic. Um, we uh, I think it's what we're seeing in the data. And thanks for all of your feedback for these sessions. Is you know a lot of you are interested in seeing what innovations are coming out. So we're we're going to be doing a lot more with these sessions as we move through. But we are continuing to uh, do our, um, our coronavirus trackers, which you can download. Apologies for those of you who tried to download last week. We've had an issue with the upload, so we were slow getting last week's up, but I will be emailing you to let you know when the latest um, version is out and available. Um, and as you might, I might mentioned, our Rare Metrics platform is, uh, is now being user tested. We've got our first uh, cohort of people testing it out if you're interested then please do let me know. Um, so far, so good. Um, but it'd be great to obviously get your, your kind of feedback on it. Um, I'm just going to briefly sum up. I've had a few questions come in. If you've got any questions, please do shout. We've got another five minutes. I'll just um, summarise a, a couple of things, I think, for this week, which are going to be really important. And that's despite the sort of, um, you know, the, the kind of language and narrative around 
um, the, the easing of, of lockdown and the, you know the obvious hypocrisy with how um, how the government have responded to things. Um, I think just be really cautious when reading news articles and stories about what impact that's going to be having on on people. We're seeing that there's still a high degree of caution and concern in the UK population, um, which you know is um, certainly uh, quite divided. It's it's not a consistent narrative. I think we're now entering a stage. We're seeing it with businesses that are getting into the planning phase of really trying to understand the, your segments a lot more, understand your, the, the kind of nuances in the data to identify people who do feel comfortable, who don't feel comfortable and managing your comms around that, I think is going to be uh, really, uh, really important. Um, so a couple of questions that have come through. Um, is the food on the, so this is the question, is the food on the, go data reflective of the footfall it sees. I believe that's probably going to be the case, yeah. Um, obviously, as people are going more into, into spaces, we can correlate that over time, of course, with looking at how these, these uh, restrictions are re relaxed. People are then going to be in their, in their environments and experiencing it. So I think that's certainly a case that the two things will, be, um, will, will correlate. Hello, hi. Hello, uh, do you have any data on charities and people's attitudes and behaviours? We've had a few requests in for charities. We, we don't cover it as standard just because uh, on these sessions because we, we try to keep it quite broad. Um, but if you've got a particular question, you can uh, get in touch. There's my contact details, by the way, if you want them. I'm just going to look through any other kind of key questions. Um, what is the consumer sentiment around shopping online? Will those who have purchased online more during this time continue to do so, excluding groceries? Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, good, really, really good question. Um, what we're seeing, I think, more broadly, is that the barrier of of buying online has been removed for lots of people. So, there is a whole thing about you know feeling like you can trust. A company with your your card details when you interview people i've seen this over the years when when working in kind of um digital uh service development lots of people still really quite worried about you know you get people who won't spend or spend small amounts of money using a mobile but more more amounts of money on a desktop because they think that it's it's safer which is quite an interesting kind of psychology uh, around that i i, I think Th there will be a halo effect of people's experiences of buying online with the Cardo and other supermarkets. It will inevitably have a hero effect. Quite what that will do for the uplift is a big question. I'm, I've been asked to present at a conference for um, uh, on the logistics side of things um, for different retailers in a, in a couple of weeks. And that is the question that they posed me to, to find out in more detail. So I, uh, I'm going to be, funny enough, looking at this question in a bit more detail around this balance of e-commerce versus physical and where people perceive their, their habits to lie. So um, let's put a flag in that one because I'm going to be investigating that um, as part of, part of that, that uh, conference in a couple of weeks. My, my team are going to be looking into it. So uh, we can certainly have a look. But my, certainly looking at the data, looking at the, the diary studies we've done, there's certainly a halo effect of the experiences of grocery with, with online. Now, the problem is going to be, does your online experience stack up? Are you offering something that is as good as the experiences I've seen elsewhere? And I think for lots of people, um, that's not the case. We've we've had a few, quite a few briefs in <clears throat> from retailers to do UX testing over the last eight weeks of their, of their e-commerce platforms because they realised that just a couple of percentage difference makes all the difference to, to sales. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be quite important. Cool. I think that's most of the urgent questions. I recognise that it's twelve o'clock, so I'm going to stop waffling. Thanks so much for uh, attending. Uh, next one will be eleven o'clock next Thursday, uh, where we'll have an update on the usual um, usual categories, but also we're going to be doing a, a, a more of an overview next week on on some of the innovations that we're seeing as well. So thanks very much. Please fill out the survey at the end. And tell your colleagues that um, about these sessions, the more the merrier. Have a good rest of your week. See you in a bit.